The date was January 25, 2005. It's Tuesday. After finishing her day of classes, Katie Coleman returned to her home in Crothersville, Indiana, in the United States. The 10-year-old shared a home with her older sister, her father, John Niece, and mother, Angela. That day when Katie arrived home, John was still at work and Angela was preparing dinner for that evening. He had a job at a nearby factory. At 3 o'clock, Katie was requested by Angela to go to the dollar store and buy some toilet paper. Katie was accustomed to traveling. It was close to her house and she had gone there a number of times. Katie wore a cozy blanket. She made her way to the dollar store despite the bitterly chilly weather. Katie purchased the toilet paper after she arrived at the dollar store. She was assisted in counting out the appropriate amount of money by the clerk. Before continuing on her way home, Katie made a pit stop at the bank next door to purchase a lollipops from their counter. Katie was taking longer than usual to return, but Angela wasn't too concerned because she suspected Katie might have just run into some friends on the way home. But when John arrived home, Katie was still gone. When neither of them could find her and there was no sign of her everywhere, they reported her missing out of a growing concern for her safety. Jackson County Sheriff's Department, how can I help you please? Yes ma'am, I need to report my daughter missing. Is she missing or did she run away? No, she's missing. And what was she wearing? She had on a light blue uh, coat, black pants and white stripes. Okay. Both the locals and the police looked for Katie. Only 1,500 people called Crothersville home at the time, and everyone there knew everyone else. However, nobody was aware of Katie's whereabouts or what had transpired. A helicopter hovered overhead, scouring the area, desperately searching for the 10-year-old girl. Then Katie's family was told some new information by her neighbor. On the day that she vanished, she had gone to their house to tell them that their dog was dead, and that it was laying down by the train tracks. This was the last recorded sighting of Katie. The police dogs had picked up her scent and had tracked it to the railroad tracks. The next instant, she vanished. An Amber Alert was issued a few days after Katie was reported missing. Katie's physical characteristics were listed on posters as having chin-length brown hair, brown eyes, and standing at a height of 4 feet 6 inches tall. The last time anyone saw her, she was dressed in black tennis shoes and a red shirt, along with black sweatpants with a stripe down the side and a medium light blue winter coat. In addition to that, they said that Katie had what was described as a lazy eye. You just got like a hundred million things going through your head. Every time I fall away, you're like, oh, it's her, it's her. A little more than 20 times had the Amber Alert been utilized in Indiana so far, and each time the youngster was discovered alive. Police believed that to be the case. In fact, it had been almost 25 years since there had been a murder in the neighborhood. Two days after Katie was reported missing, Police issued the Amber Alert after receiving a tip that they had seen a young woman who resembled Katie in a truck. The driver was characterized by the witness as a very skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. The witness reported to the police that the girl in the truck did not seem to be in any kind of distress or need for assistance. Katie's body was discovered in a creek close to Cypress Lake, north of Seymour, five days after she went missing. Just a few miles separated Katie's house and the creek. Katie had been sexually raped, her wrists and feet were tied, and drowning was the cause of death. At that point, my whole world just crushed it on me. Not only did I lose my daughter, but I lost my best friend. Shortly after she was found, they were made aware of a man that lived just a few yards from the dollar store that Katie had walked to. 
other residents in the neighborhood always thought of him as a bit of an eccentric character. Neighbors recalled that he would frequently just stand outside in his yard, staring at nothing, and that he would host parties every single night. In this small community, he stuck out like a sore thumb. This man was 20-year-old Charles or Chucky Hickman. Charles called the police on himself. 20-year-old Charles, Chucky Hickman called the police. He admitted to the police that he had kidnapped Katie along with another male. On her way home that day, she allegedly witnessed an illegal drug deal, and because of how much she had seen, he claimed they tried to terrify her into keeping quiet or not telling anyone about it. He said that he drove Katie to his house before taking her to the creek with his 22-year-old acquaintance Timothy C. A. Sullivan. They bound her hands, according to Chucky, and Katie drowned when she fell into the creek. Although it appeared that the case had been solved quickly at first, Sharl's confession turned out to be a fabrication. This likely made Katie's family's sorrow and stress worse. Instead of searching for Katie's body, police concentrated on obtaining DNA evidence and discovered a cigarette but nearby. Following the completion of DNA testing, police decided to arrest Anthony Stockelman in the early days of April 2005. The DNA from the cigarette but was compared to the DNA from Katie's body by the police. A match was made. Anthony Ray Stockelman's DNA was discovered on Katie's corpse and in the cigarette butt. Although Anthony, a father of two young sons, was visiting his mother on the day Katie vanished, he wasn't from Crothersville. Additionally, he operated a white pickup truck identical to the one a bystander claimed to have seen Katie doing that day. Anthony's prosecution faced a compelling case. They had compared his DNA to samples recovered from Katie's body, a cigarette but at the creek, red carpet fibers from Katie's body and the carpet in Anthony's mother's house, as well as swabs retrieved from Katie's body. The prosecution presented a plea deal to Anthony. They would not ask for the death penalty if he entered a guilty plea to the murder and molestation allegations. He pleaded guilty and was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In a later appeal against the severity of his sentence, Anthony argued that he was suffering from a severe mental or emotional condition at the time of Katie's kidnapping and murder. According to Anthony's testimony, his father passed away six months before the incident. He and his father had a good relationship, so when his father was diagnosed with cancer, he took care of him. He asserted that the loss of his father significantly affected his mental and emotional health. That defense was rejected by the court, and his sentence was affirmed. His life without parole sentence was confirmed. Due to the plea agreement, Anthony escaped the death penalty but still received some punishment. But this was not the end of his punishment. Jared Harris, Katie's cousin, was serving time for breaking into a home. He shared a cell with Anthony in the same jail and wing. To further punish the killer of his cousin, Jared decided to take matters into his own hands. He broke into his cell on September 22, 2006, and hid there while he awaited his chance. Harris sealed the door behind Anthony when he came back, locking him inside the cell. The words Katie's revenge are now indelibly inked over Anthony's forehead thanks to the DIY prison tattoo machine he used to scribble a lifelong reminder on his face. Considered the punishment appropriate for the crime? Tell me in the comments section below.